Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. My name is Harry Wolf and I talk about code all the time here. Today's video is a very exciting one. I intend to cover the entire front end landscape in 2021 in under 20 minutes. I have 39 separate things to discuss and to keep that under 20 minutes long, I have no more than 30 seconds per topic. So I'm not going to have as much of a preamble here, except to say that if you do enjoy this video, when you are done watching it and you are not exhausted by it, please do become a subscriber and tell your friends about it to hopefully spread the word of this video without any further ado, let's begin the marathon. First things first, we have UI libraries. The problem they're trying to solve is how do you get your browser to show the UI for your application in a efficient and productive manner. The first UI library to talk about is React, the most popular React library, the most popular UI library around right now. It looks like this. The big innovation with React was embedding the template or what your UI looks like inside your functionality, which is your JavaScript file with this thing called JSX. It goes through a compilation process that just compiles down to function calls, but it means that you can have both your template, how your UI looks alongside with your functionality. That was the big thing with React. They also have Vue.js, which is very popular as well. Um, it's very easy to add to existing applications. It's built that way. Um, the big innovation with Vue.js is that they have these things called single file components where it encapsulates all parts of a component in one file called dot view where you have the template here the functionality in the script tag and then styles in line as well it'll actually scope those styles to this component so that it actually doesn't bleed out to other places but it means that you can then use the hello component anywhere you want you have svelte which is similar to view where all functionality is encapsulated in one dot svelte file. The big difference between Svelte and Vue is that Svelte has zero runtime. You compile the Svelte application down and what's output is code that has all functionality for updating things discreetly in a functional way uh, embedded in the actual compiled component. And then you have Angular, which is geared very strongly towards the enterprise nowadays where it very focuses on TypeScript support using annotations. It reminds me of Java and OO, but it has essentially the entire kitchen sink built in. If you need to have requests, if you need to do state management, everything's built into Angular. So you don't have to really worry about anything outside of that. Let's talk about CSS styling. Uh, vanilla CSS is still widely used. There's also these things called less and SAS. These are extensions to uh, CSS that adds some functionality that is not currently present in CSS that's changing over time. But two of the big ones is variables, both less and SAS support that. The big difference between them is that less uses the at sign for variables and SAS uses the dollar sign. They both also support nesting where you can nest styles inside of one another that'll then compile down and be unnested and valid CSS and a host of other functionalities that makes it easier to be more productive writing your styles. There is also BEM, which is a convention for writing your styles such that they don't have any leakage on top of other styles where you have block element modifiers. So when you write your styles, you follow this convention of button, button state success, so that it is very clear how styles are to be applied to HTML and there's no um, global cascade of these styles externally. Um, there's also this newer thing called CSS modules, which uses a compilation step to actually work, but you write in a CSS file, your styles as you normally would. But what's neat about CSS modules is that you can actually import it into a JavaScript file and then reference the class names from that file. So you have styles.normal here from here on that component. And then when it's compiled, it actually will automatically namespace it to make it unique globally across your entire application. It's widely used in the world of React, uh, Vue and Svelte kind of have it built in by default, but it's another way of writing CSS nowadays. There's also CSS in JS, uh, Emotion.js is one of my most favorite libraries for that, where you can actually write your CSS directly on the component itself. There is a compilation step where it'll actually 
extract this for you. And there's also a small runtime cost associated as well because it actually has to inject these styles onto the page at runtime. Uh, the cost is small and I could argue that the productivity benefit far outweighs the small uh, hit on the page. You can also use a style of writing these styles called style components where you can actually put all your styles in line into this um, invocation to make a component called button such that when you use this button component, it has all these styles built in always. Then there's also a newer thing on the block called Tailwind, which uses utility first CSS. Utility first means that there are essentially class names provided by uh, Tailwind, such as text center, such that when you apply the text center class name to a element on the page, it just includes the text center, text align center attributes on there. So you can kind of compose all your styles through these toolbox of utilities on the HTML. What I find even more uh, useful with Tailwind is that it has a built-in design language that makes all of your designs look inherently cohesive. So this is saying that there's a padding top of four and there's evenly measured out um, numbers from two, four, six, such that your padding has consistent spacing throughout the entire usage of the application. It's very weird to start using, but once you actually get the hang of it, I find it very, very productive. Let's talk about routing. Uh, in the world of React, there is React Router, and you use React Router just as you would any other React components. Uh, there are no other competitors for routing with React. Everybody uses React Router. It's solved by and large. People are largely happy with it, and that's what everybody uses. In the world of Vue, there is a first party library called Vue Router that also uses components to write your layout, your routes there as well. Then we have state management, a topic that could easily take an entire video, but I will try to condense it into as small of a soundbite as possible here. First, we have Redux, which is less of a library, more of a mentality on how to write your state management library. It takes ideas from Erlang and the actor model with the idea of message passing, where you can create a Redux store with a default state. You can dispatch actions to the Redux store that understands when a certain action is passed, how to actually change the state of the store that then those listening to state changes can be notified of and get that new state there. It is more philosophy than it is a library. Uh, it's commonly used with React Redux, which acts as a binding between Redux and React, such that any changes in Redux are propagated to React, very popular in the React landscape. There is MobX, which is more of an OO model of doing state management. It essentially makes classes observable for when things are changed. So you have this class timer, it's using the MobX make auto observable. You make an instance of my timer, whenever you actually reference a value or call a method on it, it knows when parts of this observable object has changed and it can notify all those observers of that, which means that it can be very discreet and optimized when things change. It's very, very fun to play with. Um, there's also Immer from the same author as MobX that takes a more functional approach to making immutable changes to objects, such that if you have this base object, which is an array, you can use the produce function from Immer. So you're taking the base state and it kind of, and it uses the copy on write approach of making immutable changes where this draft state, you can make changes that look mutable, such that you're actually changing the state object, but it's essentially being used as a list of instructions of the changes to apply to the base state to produce the next state that is actually a new instance of the state. Next state and base state are different and produce is able to copy and write those changes in a more in a very efficient manner. So it's a great API for making immutable changes while, while still maintaining immutability. Then you also have xState, which is a state machine, the most popular and probably the only state machine library in uh, the land of front end. Um, I think of it as a fancier Redux, which someone might disagree with me with, but it's you know, I haven't used it extensively, but it's very widely loved. And uh, then we also have GraphQL, which again is a topic unto itself, but I'm not gonna go into that side of things, but to use GraphQL, there are two primary GraphQL client libraries. There is Relay from Facebook, which also made GraphQL. Um, they actually released a new API where you can actually use hooks to make 
GraphQL query statements inside of here and then use the results in your UI. The benefit of this approach is that if you also were to use CSS and JS with React, you could actually embed both your UI, your data, and your styles all in one file, which makes it kind of fun because you can get the entire picture of what that component can do. Um, there's also Apollo GraphQL client, which was the original user of hooks for accessing GraphQL, very similar to Relay, a little bit more geared towards open source than Relay is. Testing libraries, the unsung heroes of every highly functioning application. We have Jest, which is a very popular framework nowadays that has very typical assertions for things. The big advantage of Jest is the developer experience when you actually use the Jest CLI. You have this wonderful UI presented to you in the command line where you can see what tests are passing, which are running. You also have built-in code coverage, easy mocking. Jest pretty much includes everything that you may need for writing UI tests, uh, front-end tests built in, in a very easy to use manner that works the sums of the parts are greater than the whole. It's a lovely, lovely experience. Uh, we also have Mocha, which is the original JavaScript test runner, which is both a test runner with also assertions in there as well, which is also still wildly used. And then for actually testing your UI libraries, the most one of the big new popular libraries is called uh, the testing library suite of libraries. Um, there's one for React, there's one for Vue, one for Svelte, and the big philosophy here with the testing library suite is that when you write your UI tests, you're writing them from the perspective of a user, such that if a user were to come around and get the text in the UI that says load and then fire the click event, you would wait on the screen to see when this text appears and then make an assertion there. So it's from the user's perspective of the tests using public APIs for these libraries, which is in contrast to Enzyme, one of the original testing libraries for React, which takes a different approach, which actually has understanding of React internals, such that you can do things like setting props on a rendered component and making, modif and making modifications of it to actually make more unit testing of the actual component. Uh, the downside of this approach is that because it relies on the internals of React, when React changes its internals, Enzyme has to update itself to support that new version which means it always lags the version, whereas with testing library, it uses the public API and it is always ever present. Then we also have Cypress, which makes end-to-end -end testing fun. I've never had end-to-end -end testing be fun before. This does. You write your test just as you would with Jest or Mocha with these nice little assertions, but the true magic of uh, Cypress is the actual developer experience such that when you actually run this test file, it pops open this browser that actually shows you all the commands that you asked to be done and the browser doing those commands as well. It's an incredible experience that this doesn't actually fully show you what it means. So you, I encourage you to try it out if you want to, but these test commands load the page and then runs it there. It's a lovely, lovely experience. Speaking of developer productivity, this is that section. First is prettier, which is one of my most favorite libraries in a long time. If you've used Go in the past, this is similar to Go format, where given any weirdly formatted source file, it'll output the source file in a consistently formatted way. And it is wonderful because it removes a whole host of PR comments from asking people to make certain spacing requirements or semicolon usages. It removes all those comments and makes all styles consistent across the entire code base, which means that it's both easier to read and understand because all the code looks the same. It is absolutely wonderful. You also have ESLint, which is a linter, which makes suggestions on how you can improve your code. Um, it's saying that you're using foo as a sign to value, but never used. So if you use foo, then that ESLint warning goes away. A lot of rich rules that you can use to customize for your own application's needs. And then you have Storybook, which is a wonderful way of developing your isolated UI components, where you can make a Storybook file that contains these three lines of code that when you run Storybook, you get this entire UI for free that you can easily develop and iterate on these components in isolation in a wonderful way. You can use it as a Great, easy way to get started with a design system by using Storybook. It's awesome. Transpilation. We have 
TypeScript, one of the one of the most popular transpilation libraries out there, which notably adds typing to JavaScript, meaning that you have strictly typed parts of your language uh, of JavaScript. What's also benefit What's also a benefit there is the tooling that TypeScript provides, where you can get these nice little inline messages to make for large teams, large code bases. TypeScript is invaluable for adding strictly for adding uh, strong types to JavaScript. We also have Babel, which is the original uh, transpilation library. Um, the use case of here is that it, you can you cannot control what browsers your users use. They might want to use IE11, and you can't control that. However, you may want to use the most modern, fun JavaScript technologies, and you can have your cake and eat it too with Babel, where you can write these advanced, more uh, new JavaScript code that Babel will then transpile down to code that will run in IE11. And that's used widely throughout the entire front end ecosystem. Build tools. Uh, we have NPM, which is the original package manager for Node that is also now used for front end, where you can install dependencies and manage them there. You have Yarn, which is an alternative to NPM for doing the same thing. How it actually handles dependencies and Sibling dependencies is a little bit different, like the algorithm is a little bit different than NPM. So there's pros and cons to both, but it's also very widely popular. Um, we have Webpack, which is a module bundler. Uh, most browsers do not have built-in support for, for modules in the browser, unfortunately, which means that you have multiple JS files, it's not that efficient to have those loaded in the browser. So instead you use a thing like Webpack, where if you have a lot of JS files, some templates, all these styles. You can run all these things through Webpack and it'll output just one JS file that you can then load onto your browser and then have the application run from there. One of the big downsides of Webpack is that it is configuration heavy. This is the configuration JSON that you have. These things are actually contracted. You can actually expand it for more options. Um, it actually is, it can be very, very hard to configure Webpack correctly, but that's also the power from there because you have the ability to configure it to do whatever you may need. Uh, opposed to that is a thing called Parcel, which is a zero configuration Webpack bundler where you can just quickly stand up an application, use Parcel, and it'll just bundle your application without any complaints at all. So a very easy way to start scaffolding out a new application for yourself. Then there's also Vite, which is another another alternative to Parcel, also zero config. It has also defaults built into it. Um, the thing that's new about, about Vite is in the next section, which is the extra and beyond section. And the first thing here is this thing called ES Build, which is an alternative to Webpack 5. And the most notable feature of ES Build as a bundler is that it is very, very, very fast. Webpack 4, Webpack 5 takes close to a minute to bundle an application. In this case, they're looking at 3.js as like their benchmark. ES build, it takes less than half a second. How does it do that? It is not written in JavaScript. It is written in Go. And this is a new trend that we're seeing in the front end ecosystem where there are more tools for JavaScript being written in non-JavaScript languages. There's also things written in Rust. This one's written in Go. We have here React Native, which you can take all your knowledge that you have writing React applications, such as using React components and styles, and write that write a React Native application with that same knowledge and have it actually render out to a native iOS or Android application. So same knowledge targeting towards a different uh, render place, which is awesome. And last but not least, we have WebAssembly, which is a format for rendering compile, for compiling languages to run in the browser, such that you could take a C or Rust program, compile it down and targeting WebAssembly, and then run that WebAssembly application in the browser. I've seen them take Doom, compile it through this thing called uh, ECMAScriptum, which then can target WASM, which is WebAssembly, that can then be ran in the browser, and then run Doom in the browser. And with that, we are done. The front end 2021 landscape in just under 20 minutes. I am thoroughly exhausted. I hope you are too. Uh, if you enjoyed that, let me know. Let me know what you agree with. Let me know what things you think I 
missed including in this list. This is a always evolving list. This is what I think is currently the de facto things that are included, but I'm curious to hear where you agree or disagree. And if you enjoy this video, subscribe so that I keep making videos like these and having fun doing so. That's it for me. Thank you so much for watching. Stay happy, stay coding. See you next time.